I will start. Welcome back, everybody, from that break. So uh, good afternoon. My name is Shanna Egan, and I am a senior at the University of Arizona studying geosciences. Uh, this summer, I had the privilege of joining Dr. Nicole Ovendusky and her Ocean Biogeochemistry Research Group at CU Boulder to investigate um, our project, which I will present to you today. Um, this project wouldn't have been uh, able to gone forward without the help from uh, the RECESS program and the National Science Foundation. So our research project this summer was essentially trying to focus on how do volcanic eruptions impact uh, phytoplankton productivity. So how are phytoplankton and volcanic eruptions even connected together? You know, when you first think of volcano eruption, you don't necessarily connect that necessarily with the marine sphere. But when a volcanic eruption uh, occurs, two things can happen that can impact phytoplankton production. First things first, um, when a volcano erupts, you know, you have that uh, gorgeous release of uh, gases, particular matter, ash, all up into that upper atmosphere. So when that is, uh, when that reaches the very upper atmosphere, what can happen is first, it can cool the uh, global climate. When that occurs, that can disrupt uh, ocean dynamics. So for example, that can disturb uh, cold water upwelling, which brings nutrients up to the surface where phytoplankton you know, thrive. And so that can uh, restrict the access to the nutrients necessary for phytoplankton to um, essentially thrive. And second, when all of that ash and gas re reaches the upper atmosphere, that can block solar radiation. Now we know that phytoplankton are plants, so they are highly dependent upon uh, solar radiation for a bunch of their biologic processes. So volcanic eruptions in that way can interrupt uh, significantly interrupt um, phytoplankton productivity. So when I say phyto, phytoplankton productivity, you know, what metric are we actually using? What metric are we analyzing? You know, that change, that possible change in phytoplankton productivity. So what we're specifically looking at is something called primary production. This is a biological process of phytoplankton. And it's essentially the way they take inorganic carbon, for example, CO2 present in seawater. They take that CO2 and through primary production and sunlight and cellular growth, they convert that CO2 structure into organic carbon, which is usable for living organisms further along the food web. So not only are phytoplankton uh, very important in that regard to the uh, Earth's climate, or sorry, Earth's carbon cycle, um, they're also extremely significant for the food web. Um, so through this process of primary production, phytoplankton take up about 25% of atmospheric um, carbon dioxide. And in an average year, we should expect about 56 petagrams of carbon to be produced in this process um, with a seasonal variability of about plus or minus 10 petagrams of carbon, um, you know, due to seasonal variability. So what we're looking at specifically is the impact of one specific volcanic eruption, and that is the 1981 Mount Pinatubo eruption. This was an eruption in uh, the Philippines, and it was the second largest volcanic eruption in the 20th century. So I should mention that our work is based upon past modeling work, specifically by Adabar et al. 2019. What they did was very similar to what we have done. Um, they analyzed how did the Mount Pinatubo eruption, how did that volcanic eruption impact the ocean environment? So what they looked at was sea surface temperature, O2 flux, CO2 flux, and um, all of those factors. And what we're doing through our project is just taking it a step further by seeing, you know, yes, we understand this environment changed, but how did the organisms living inside of it change as well? Um, so what that study found was that in between the years of 1991 to 1993 is where the ocean environment um, had the strongest change as a result of this volcanic eruption. Now, specifically in the year 1992, so if I direct your attention to this pink circle, um, you'll see this very uh, large red tongue that is characteristic of an El Nino event. So what Edibar et al. Um, found was that the volcanic eruption, the 1981 volcanic eruption, induced El Nino signatures in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. 
So this is significant um, because when sea surface temperature increases, this leads to a decrease in primary production. So this is kind of our expectations going forth in our work. Um, and we're expecting to see uh, after we have done our data analysis. So how is this even possible? What we use uh, Earth system modeling, specifically one model called the Community Earth System Model Version 1 Large Ensemble Suite. So Edobar et al. Um, and this project use two simulations. So the first one is CSM1 LE. This is historical data um, with the Pinatubo eruption inside of it. And second simulation used was the CSM1 LE no Pinatubo, which is, which is essentially a, a modified reality in which the volcanic eruption hadn't occurred in the first place. And so through earth system modeling, um, what we're able to do is we're able to simultaneously simulate the atmosphere, the land, the cryosphere, and all of those different dynamics, how they interact with each other to figure out how does global climate change, you know, in different um, hypothetical situations and scenarios. So in our case, the hypothetical scenario is, first off, we're simulating what happened with the volcanic eruption and what happened without that volcanic eruption. And by taking the difference between the two, we're able to um, uh, find if there's any change in that primary production. So again, um, just to further clarify, we're taking CSM1 LE, CSM1 LE, no Pinatubo, and we're finding the difference between the two to find uh, delta uh, primary production of the global oceans. When we do simulations of uh, CSM1 LE and CSM1 Ali no Pinatubo, what we find is there's this sort of heartbeat signature and that variability that you see, for example, here to here, that's just the seasonal variability. So um, a benefit of taking the difference between the two is not only do you get to see whether there is a change um, from that volcanic eruption, but you're also able to remove this uh, seasonal variability. So if we take the difference between the two, we are, uh, we are left with this time series. So for our project, we were specifically focusing on the years 1991 to 1993 to sort of um, uh, corroborate the results of Edibar et al. 2019. And what we can find here between 1991 to 1993 is that globally, there wasn't really that much change in primary production. Unexpectedly, however, in 1996, we have this very strong signal and increase of primary production that we're not too sure about, but we will go through both 1991 to 1993, and then I will discuss 1996 results. So in 1991 to 1993, like I said, if you look in the nitty gritty of this time series, there really isn't too much global change in primary production. However, if we do look regionally, and if I direct your attention to 1992, we can see very strong signals of uh, decrease in primary production along the equatorial uh, Pacific Ocean. And this, is, uh, this corroborates the results of Edibar et al. 2019. If you recall earlier, I said an increase in sea surface temperature leads to a decrease in primary production. This is pretty much what we can see in 1992. So although the Mount Pinatubo eruption didn't necessarily cause that great of a shift in primary production globally, um, regionally, there was a significant um, impact, especially along the equatorial uh, Pacific Ocean, which corroborates results of previous work. If we look at 1996, like I said, um, you know, we have that strong signal. I just showed you that strong signal, but it was only regional, right? Now, this event that we're not too sure about, this event was such a strong event and led to a global increase in uh, primary production by about one petagram carbon per year to at least register this strong signal. So if we look regional, regionally, um, we see these results. Um, we're not too sure about <laughs> why exactly this happened, but if you recall from my methods, what we did was take the uh, subtraction of the historical data by the no Pinatubo run. And so the historical data by the reality in which the eruption didn't happen. And since it registered this very strong peak, that means that this did occur, um, this 
did occur in the simulation that corresponds most to our reality. And therefore, um, this was probably influenced in some way by the Mount Pinatubo eruption. Um, this is unexpected because uh, right now uh, we haven't really, uh, previous work at Avar et al. didn't see necessarily a signal in 1996. And yet in you know, uh, the real life simulation, so to speak, we see this very strong signal of an increase in primary production along the uh, Western Pacific Ocean and a very strong decrease of primary production in the Eastern Indian Ocean. So um, this prompts future work, specifically looking at uh, whether the sea surface temperature changed, whether nutrients available to the, um, to the phytoplankton in the top 150 meters changed at all. Um, these are uh, methods we can try to find and describe this phenomenon using the same Earth system modeling for this project. So in conclusion, I want to say that the Mount Pinatubo eruption triggers an El Nino-like signature in 1992 um, that leads to a decrease in regional primary production in the uh, equatorial Pacific. And second, we have a uh, climate event in 1996 that we're not necessarily too sure what caused it, but leads uh, questions for future work. So these are my acknowledgements. I wouldn't have been able to done this project without my help from my mentors um, and help from the National Science Foundation. And also uh, this research was conducted on the traditional territories of the following Native American nations and communities. Any questions? Great job. And now we will take any questions that you have. Lon, you have a question. Always got a question. <laughs> so Shan, I've asked you this question before about the um, 1996 thing, and I thought that was a really clear explanation. Do you have any hypotheses? I can see why you would pin it on uh, Pinatubo because it's in your simulation versus you know no Pinatubo. But do you have any mechanistic hypotheses about why the eruption would have that kind of a lag time and and create that effect? Hey, thank you for your question, Lon. So we're not entirely too sure about why the Pinatubo eruption would have affected climate um, so strongly. Well, not climate. I should say the ocean environment so strongly five years after the fact. Um, but what we can look at specifically to figure out what are the reasons behind this um, very strong increase in primary production is uh, we can look at so when sea surface temperature um, becomes colder, that indicates a larger uh, cold water upwelling. So that can bring more nutrients to the surface. Um, that's a possible hypothesis that we can look into. Again, um, using sea surface temperature data, using the same methods that we, uh, <laughs> that we use for this project, we can uh, do the same sort of data analysis. Oh, my lights are going out. Sorry about that. Um, so, we can use that sort of same analysis to uh, figure out whether, you know, maybe it was upwelling, um, maybe it was a climate pattern. You know, we can use uh, atmospheric, this does atmospheric calculations as well to figure out whether um, maybe it was a climate uh, impact. Um, so we're not entirely too sure, but those are some uh, avenues we can pursue in the future. Thanks, and Anika, can I do a, just a follow-up question on that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thanks, uh, Shannon. That was a really clear explanation. And I was struck when you gave um, this um, image that you've got up here now is that uh, most of that the global signal is happening with an increase in primary productivity um, in the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, which is, I would think, exactly what you would expect during a typical El Nino. Have you looked to see is that sort of what happens is a, a big increase in net primary productivity in the um, Eastern Equatorial Pacific with El Nino? I would think that would be the case, but I don't know. So yeah, that's a very good, um, that's, that's a very fair assumption to um, conclusion you could draw from these results. Um, however, what, what we should expect during an El Nino event is actually opposite. We should expect a very large decrease in primary production. And La Nina isn't 
what you would think as an opposite of an El Nino. La Nina doesn't lead to necessarily a large increase in primary production. So seeing this sort of signal um, doesn't necessarily uh, correlate with an El Nino event, although, um, although you know, that was my first assumption when I first saw this too. I was like, oh, El Nino, but no, that's um, not necessarily the case because um, it doesn't necessarily correlate with El Nino. It doesn't correlate with La Nina. We're not too sure necessarily what <laughs> phenomenon this is um, because this is very strong increases of primary production, um, especially along the equatorial uh, Pacific Ocean. But um, did that did that answer your question? It did. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course.